Well, it says we're live. Hello, hello. It's Tuesday. It's four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, uh, seven o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. Wednesday morning in London and most of Europe, uh, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, somewhere around 11.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in New Zealand. I do never get that one right. I'm not sure <laughs> why, but it's Facebook Live. <laughs> and I'm welcome everyone. And we have a really interesting um, um, show today. I guess it's um, from both men and women alike, um, literally about 65 million people in this country alone. When people go to say their traditional primary care doctor and complain of hair loss, really, um, you know, the doctors are writing prescriptions for um, you know, either recommending minoxidil, Rogaine, or talking about, um, you know, well, if it's really serious, then looking into implants and things of that, transplants, et cetera. But in the field of functional medicine that you and I are in, we take a completely different approach, right? So we take a very, very root cause approach to hair loss. And the way that I always say for my patients to sort of start with this journey, like I've done twice over in my life, once when I was postpartum and lost chunks of hair right from here 17 years ago when my son was born. And trust me, for a woman in her 30s, when she has that much hair loss, it becomes a huge self-esteem issue, you know? And then the right. second time right. I dealt with hair loss was due to my cancer journey when I went through chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, the hair was just getting very thin and splotchy. And so I just took a razor and shaved it off because I knew how to bring it back. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's really yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you're a walking testimonial to this. Oh my gosh, you bet, you bet. I mean, this is all new hair growth since the chemotherapy last year. So I know it, can, gosh, well, it can be done. Thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. So, I really uh, appreciate Jill, that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say hello to a few people here. Jill's yeah, here from Alaska. Hi, Jill. Susan's from the Sand Hills of Nebraska. I didn't know there were Sand Hills in Nebraska. That's great. I have to look into that. Uh, Amal's here from Marina Del Rey. Hello, Amal. Uh, Michelle Wood says hello. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to the questions. Um, uh, Margaret's here from Georgia. Mindy's in the house from Kentucky. Jennifer's here from Virginia. Um, hello, everyone. And I'll keep um, acknowledging people um, uh, throughout the show. Uh, but and my team will post questions in the chat so that they're easier to see. The first one, Jennifer is asking, can you have TSI antibodies and be hypothyroid? Absolutely. Absolutely, you can. So, you know, you can actually, that's when you have antibodies that are being uh, created against your thyroid, that's what we call Hashimoto's. And usually Hashimoto's thyroiditis has more of a hypothyroid picture than the other way around. So I'm really glad this, this question came because when it pertains to hair loss, the thyroid hormones are particularly important. Of course, so are your adrenal hormones and your sex hormones. But the thyroid hormones, as you and I both know, are incredibly important. And I'd like to kind of give a little pearl so people can actually jot this down. When you're asking your physician to test you for low thyroid or thyroid imbalance, you want to do a complete analysis of a TSH, a free T3, a reverse T3, which is often not done, a free T4, thyroid antibodies. So both your antithyroglobulin antibody and thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And that's what's gonna give you the true picture of what's going on in your thyroid because your TSH may look within normal limits, but more often than not, you really might be suffering from hypothyroid or subclinical hypothyroid picture because you really want your TSH to be optimal, not just within the normal limits of 0.4 to 4.5, which Dr. Tom, you and I know is such an incredibly wide range and we really need to optimize that. And we need to make sure that we don't have those antibodies attacking our thyroid gland and if we do, then we need to jump right on it because one of the first things that people will see in addition to things like 
weight gain, slowing of the metabolism, maybe constipation, insomnia is hair loss. A lot right. of people see hair loss when it comes to thyroid. So great question. It's very common. Right. It's at the top of the list when yes. hair loss is there. Yes. You have to rule out if there is a contribution coming from your thyroid. And everyone needs to remember for any condition that you might get, there usually are multiple triggers yes. that are affecting your body in the way that it's manifesting, not just one. And yes. we'd love to grab onto just one, but it's not that way. Most mm -hmm. of the time, it's not. Mm -hmm. There's a Absolutely. primary, there's a primary, but yes. uh, where we want to start first. Uh, right. Lynette's here from Sydney, Oz, OZ. So I guess that's that's a way of talking about Australia, Oz. I just don't know, <laughs> don't know that one, Lynette. And she signs a Lynette Courtney hypnotherapy. And the picture of Lynette is a really happy person. So I'm hypnotized <laughs> by your picture, Lynette. Thank you so much much that's great so nice that you're here thank you thank you for being here brenda's here from minnesota kathleen's in michigan another brenda's in tampa florida um uh, cindy cindy foley in pennsylvania and the list goes on and on the next question uh let's see uh cat says can you please list all those again tsh reverse t3 so there's six there are six markers that should be the standard marker anytime you're looking at thyroid function. Unfortunately, many doctors will only look at one and they look at TSH and TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Now TSH is not made by your thyroid mm -hmm. and it's not a marker of thyroid function. TSH is a messenger hormone produced in your pituitary that tells the thyroid, this is how much hormone I need. Correct. So TSH, if it's high, <laughs> it's telling the thyroid, I need more hormone. I need more hormone. I need more hormone. Well, that's important, but that's a measure of pituitary function and not thyroid function because there's something called euthyroid, EU thyroid, euthyroid, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. your hormone levels are normal, but TSH is elevated. Well, wait a minute, there's enough hormone in the blood test, but the pituitary is telling your thyroid, you need more hormone. That's an example where TSH is not a marker of thyroid function. It's a marker of your body telling your pituitary and the pituitary responding saying, we need more hormone. But wait a minute, there's enough hormone in the bloodstream for some people. What does that mean? It means it's in the bloodstream. Your bloodstream's just a highway. It's just a highway carrying a lot of traffic. It's all going in the same direction, but it's a highway. But the, if the hormone can't get inside the cell, then the cell is functioning as if there's not enough hormone. And that functional um, disruption <laughs> is what right. triggers the pituitary to say, we need more hormone, we need more hormone. So when you understand that concept, then the question is, well, why would anyone ever use TSH as the only marker if there's a problem with the thyroid or not? And the answer is, well, we've always done it that way. And that's what the textbooks say. And that's what insurance will pay for easily. So that's how we do it. That doesn't cut it anymore. And if you have a doctor that responds that way, when you ask them the question, in that case, that doctor may have some really good skills, but you need another doctor on your team True. who has a little more current um, outlook on that. So um, Dr. Shell, could you repeat those different tests that you mentioned once again? Absolutely. So TSH, like you mentioned, the thyroid stimulating hormone, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, which is extremely important, antithyroglobulin antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And some people like to get a total T4 as well. Um, so those would be um, the crucial ones that you want to get because that will tell you so much about what might be going on. As an example, if you've never had your reverse T3 checked, and if your reverse T3 is on the high end of normal or even higher than the normal range, you're going to know that something is awry because your T4 should be converting to T3, which is the active form of thyroid, 
not reverse T3, which actually will bind that receptor site that actually is waiting to be bound by the T3, the good stuff. So it's going to bind it and not allow for that receptor site to be open for the T3. And a lot of times that could be an effect of excessive stress, adrenal issues, nutritional issues, toxicity, perhaps even estrogen dominance. So, you know, I think what we have to understand is excessive daily hair shedding, <clears throat> which is known as telogen effluvium, is quite common. Whoa, whoa, there was a geek word there, wasn't there? <laughs> I love the geek word, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, that's something that I think everybody needs to understand. Each of us will shed about 5,200 hairs a day. And it might seem like a lot, but you know, that's the normal process because the hair cycle is very interesting. It's sciencey, but it's very cool. So um, if, if it's okay with you, Dr. Tom, I'd love to go into the different stages. Because um, when you're looking at hair loss, I think it's important to understand that each hair follicle on our scalp undergoes three stages of a life cycle per se. So there's the anagen cycle, which is the active growth phase um, in which the hair becomes longer and thicker. And so that's the great phase that you want, right? Then there's the catagen phase, which after anagen, the hair follicles will move into this short transitional phase called catagen when the hair fibers stop growing and it followed by the resting phase called telogen, which lasts about three months. Now, during telogen, the old hair that is gradually, it's pushed up toward the skin surface before it is then shed naturally. And then it is replaced, if everything's working well, with new emerging anagen hair. So your goal is, I want most of my hair to be either in the anagen phase or the telogen phase. When you have an excess amount going into the hair loss stage, which can happen by a number of different things, right? So like I mentioned, toxicity, hormonal imbalance. If you are converting the testosterone in your body to DHT, dihydrotestosterone, then that harms hair follicles. And that can happen in both men and women. It's sort of what we call male pattern baldness. Um, and so when that happens, you really need to look at the hormonal balance and see what we can do to fix that. But also in women, we have to look and see what's going on hormonally between their estrogen and progesterone, because if that is imbalanced and you have estrogen dominance or if a woman's hormone testosterone, which we also have, and it's a very important hormone for women is getting converted to DHT at an excessive rate, then you can have hair loss with that as well. So sorry about the geekiness there. I just, no, I really that, like to explain that. That's excellent. Uh, but people who are really interested in this will have to go back and listen to that again. Yeah. And take yeah. notes because there are so many bullet points mm -hmm. in there that are right on the money. Yeah. And it's just a lot for someone to absorb all of that. But the message is mm -hmm. there are many different triggers that can impact on your thyroid function. Right. Many and thyroid is so. So I'd like to just take a moment on thyroid here to give people an overview. Sure. That sure. what what is thyroid hormone for? There's only two substances that I know of mm -hmm. that have receptor sites on every cell of the body, every single cell. And what that means is that every single cell needs those two substances. And those two substances are vitamin D. Mm -hmm. and thyroid hormone. Every yeah. cell in your body needs vitamin D. That's why you don't want to have okay vitamin D levels. You want robust. And we've been saying for a long time, between 50 and 75 is the target number. If you're in the US, that's NG per ML. And every lab reports it, um, NG per ML. If you're outside the US, then the lab might use different measurements. And it's easy to go online and convert from NG per ml to whatever your country's uh, measurements are. It's really easy to do that. So that's the goal of, of where we want to be uh, uh, is between 50 and 75 nanograms per milliliter of vitamin D to have robust levels. Mm -hmm. And so what about thyroid? What, what, what is this thing with thyroid hormone? You know, it's such a little gland that just sits right here that why is it so important? It 
you know, on the wall of your house, you have something on the wall of your home called a thermostat. And the job of the thermostat is to keep the house warm. And everybody goes about their business in the house. If it's too cold, you're not, you know, you, it affects how you live in the house, right? Right. But many people will turn the automatic timer on a thermostat. So when everybody goes to sleep at night, maybe around 11 or 12, it automatically turns the temperature down, maybe to the mid 60s, maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher, depending on your threshold. But the idea is to save fuel. And then in the morning, you've had it set so it automatically kicks up before the alarm clock goes off. So the house is nice and warm by the time you wake up, but you're saving fuel. <laughs> That's good right. for the planet and good for your pocketbook, right? So the thermostat controls the temperature. Your thyroid hormone is the thermostat controlling the temperature of every cell of your body, meaning how hot that cell runs. It's called your metabolism. And that's what thyroid hormone controls is your temperature of your heart cells, you know, how fast they run, how hard they run, the temperature of the collagen in your joints and mm -hmm. how often they reproduce and the temperature in the lens of your eye so that the pupil opens and closes with the, everything in your body. Absolutely. It's regulated by your thyroid hormone. And what happens for some people is that the receptors, and most of you have heard me say receptors are like catcher's mitt and the pitcher throws the ball to the catcher, that the receptor sites on every cell of your body for thyroid hormone, if they get plugged up and the thyroid hormone can't get into the receptor site, because when it does get into the receptor site, it turns the doorknob, which opens the cell wall and the mm -hmm. hormone goes inside then the cell right. wall closes. That's what a receptor site does, is it attracts a specific hormone, specific to that receptor site, progesterone won't go into the thyroid receptor site, adrenal hormones won't go into a thyroid receptor site, but thyroid hormone goes into a thyroid receptor site, turns the door, doorknob, opens the door, the hormone goes inside the cell, and then the cell can function at its normal pace to do whatever that cell is supposed to do. And for many, many people with thyroid imbalances, you have to clean up their receptor sites because their receptor sites are all full of crud yes. that's accumulated in the receptor site. And the most common crud are three chemicals called chlorine, fluoride, and bromide. Mm -hmm. so that's all your drinking water. If you live in a metropolitan area and they put chlorine in the water, or if you swim in a pool, so for those of you that have hair loss and you swimming is your exercise, you have to reevaluate. Uh, maybe I should alternate um, the type of exercise I do or find a pool that's not chlorine filtered, uh, but using a different filtration system uh, because that could easily be the trigger that's setting you off. And we could do a whole session. On we could. <laughs> we're, not, we're not, this is... This is on hair loss, but you have to do thyroid first you because do. it's so very common as yeah. a strong contributor to hair loss. Yes. So, Dr. Yeah. Shell, what's number two on the list? So, you know, to when you try to summarize um, the different causes of hair loss, you know, first I like to kind of look at the two big um, categories. So one of the big categories is genetic predisposition, right? So if there's a chance that you're genetically predisposed to hair thinning, you may see a progressive gradual reduction in hair volume. And in these instances, certain hair follicles are actually sensitive, more sensitive than normal to male hormones or testosterone, DHT. And it causes the follicles to gradually shrink and produce slightly finer and shorter hairs. But I want to kind of say, make a point here that a lot of people might say, oh, well, it's my genes and I'm genetically predisposed. Dr. Tom and I always know and talk to our patients about it, that the epigenetic component is so much more important than the genetic component, because you could have a genetic predisposition to different chronic diseases, autoimmune diseases, even hair loss, but it's really the reactive component. That's the other type of hair loss. It's the epigenetics and everything that goes within 
stabilizing and balancing your body, may that I, is what you can may control. I, uh, excuse me, may I right there help people stay in the flow with you? Yes. So people think, oh, I've got the genes for breast cancer. I'm going to get breast cancer. No, you're not. No, you're not. Oh, I've got the genes for Alzheimer's. I'm going to get Alzheimer's like my mother. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. What the genes mean for more than 70% of the diseases out there or, and, right. and the genetic expression, for more than 70% of them, the genes don't dictate you're getting the disease. Absolutely. The dictate you're vulnerable to getting right. that disease. You know, if you pull at a chain, it always breaks at the weakest mm -hmm. link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. Your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your weak link is. Yeah. Now, the weak link is determined by your genetics. But it's the pull on the chain that yes. determines whether or not that link breaks. Correct. What is that? And as Dr. Shell said, it's the epigenetics, which means around the genes. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Here's how you think about this. Genes don't turn on and off. Genes operate on dimmer switches. Mm -hmm. and genes can be ramped up to be really bright, or they can be dimmed down to be really low. So you can make the genes of Alzheimer's really bright and kill off brain cells, kill off brain cells, kill off brain cells. Or you can make the gene of Alzheimer's really dimmed down and not doing any damage at all. And okay. what controls... Where's the hand on the dimmer switch that's doing all that? It's what's around the genes called the epigenetics. Well, what Correct. is that? It means everything that's in your bloodstream, everything that you're inhaling is the, the triggers that turn on genes of inflammation or calm down genes of inflammation. That's what we mean by epigenetics. What's that's going right. on around the genes? And that's determined by what you put in your mouth, what you put up your nose, mm -hmm. and what kind of thoughts you have and stress hormones you're producing. Those, right. those are the big kahunas in terms of turning genes on and off. So Dr. Shell, please continue. I just wanted them to be on the same page about epigenetics yes. versus yes. genetics. Thank you for, thank you for that. So, um, you know, and, and I, I also want to mention that because it gives patients and people in general a lot more empowerment, right? Don't look at that genetic predisposition as something that you feel all low about. You should just be super empowered that, you know what, regardless of the genetic predisposition, just like Dr. Tom said, my final, you know, whether I'm going to get this or not get this is really in my own hands. And I have control. So that's what makes it very important for you to be your own advocate. So, you know, moving right along as far as the next thing. So we talked about sex hormones, right? We talked about estrogen dominance. We talked about testosterone turning to DHT. We talked about the very important thyroid hormone, stress. Stress is another really big um, cause, root cause for hair loss. It's no myth, right? That excess stress can literally make your hair fall out. You know, we say, oh my God, I'm so stressed. I just want to pull my hair out, right? Well, how does this really happen? What stress does, and when you have a lot of cortisol in your body, when you are constantly in a sympathetic state, meaning you're always feeling this fight or flight, um, that in itself, when you have that fight or flight constantly and your cortisol is just pumping out, that can actually cause hair loss because stress can also trigger scalp problems, right? That um, disrupt different things that are going on, the nutritional intake that goes on, as well as it can disrupt your eating habits and mess with the digestive system, which gets me to the microbiome, which I know you've heard a lot about if you've been listening to Dr. Tom's um, Facebook lives, because he's a world expert on the digestive system. But that all kind of goes together and it leads to one thing after another. So when you think of stress, you want to think about your adrenal hormones. Now, how do you tell what's going on with your adrenals? Well, in our practice and, you know, in most functional medicine doctor practices, we like to check your adrenal hormones. We do a salivary test, which checks four levels of your cortisol during the day, because you need to see what your circadian rhythm is doing, because that level of stress, and it's especially ongoing and long-term stress can lead to hair loss. 
The next thing can be iron deficiency anemia. People don't think about this very much. And I would say about 80% of people, unless they have extreme fatigue or um, very, very intense bleeding, never get checked for iron deficiency anemia. So an iron deficiency specifically, you may not may or may not be anemic per se, but one of the most common causes of hair loss in women especially is an iron deficiency. And iron is essential for producing hair cell protein, which is keratin. Without it, your strands will suffer and it's best to speak to your doctor about checking for that so that we can correct it very easily. And, uh, and so that's the next thing, Dr. Um, Tom. Um, there's several more, but we can pause and um, you know, talk about that a little bit if yeah, you Thank want. you so much, yeah. yeah. Um, 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 yeah there's so much to say. Uh, yes. what, what you're hearing is what you hear often when you're listening to functional medicine practitioners talk. Uh, you know, for example, there's a question that came in from Rajendra that says, what do I need to monitor for my thyroid now that I am on amiodarone, which is a pretty strong medication to try to stabilize your heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And you know, people have problems with their, their heart rhythm uh, for a number of different reasons, and they're put on this medication that can um, impact on thyroid function and many other tissues of the body. So he's asking the question, it's a valid question, a really important question. Mm -hmm. uh, and people ask that question, whether it's because they have irregular heartbeats and they're on this medication, or they have uh, rheumatoid arthritis and they're on um, a different type of a steroid or a different type of immune inhibiting drug or they have hair loss and they're on steroids for hair loss. What do I need to do for this? And people don't like the answer. They just <laughs> don't like it. You know, it's that we are such sophisticated beings. Do you know 36% of all of the small molecules in your bloodstream at any time come from and are the exhaust of the bacteria in your gut. Mm -hmm. It's called the metabolites, but that just means the exhaust is what the bacteria makes. So if you have too much of the wrong kind of bacteria in your gut, like Pseudomonas or Klebsiella or too much Candida, a yeast, the exhaust that that bacteria or that yeast is making gets in your bloodstream. Turns mm -hmm. out it's over a third of everything in your bloodstream. And why does it get in the bloodstream? Because they're the messengers from the gut that go to tell the brain what to do, that tell the thyroid what to do, that tell the heart how to beat. It's the microbiome that produces all of these different directions. These directions come from the bacteria in your gut. Mm -hmm. And when people understand that, of <laughs> First question they should be asking when they're talking about their particular concern, whether it's irregular heartbeats or losing your hair or uh, joint problems or skin problems or brain fog. The first question is, how, could, how might the microbiome be affecting my brain fog? Mm -hmm. Or how might the, because there, there's another question here. Someone said, and I don't remember your name, I'm sorry. Someone said, you know, I've been gluten-free for a month now and I still have terrible brain fog. W what do I do? And that's a really good question. But as uh, in what I've just said, the first thing you have to ask, how might my microbiome be contributing to this? Mm -hmm. So that's true with hair loss. That's true. So let's talk for a moment about microbiome and hair loss. And Dr. Shell, how, how might we address that topic? Very important topic. I'm glad we're talking about it. Um, like you said, the gut microbiome is the center of most everything we do in functional medicine. So we always say inflammation is the root cause of most chronic diseases that we see now. As an example, uh, my husband has ALS and that's a neurodegenerative disease. 
Now, we know in the field of functional medicine, we target the gut microbiome as one of the first things we do, regardless of a person coming in with chronic fatigue, autoimmune conditions, neurodegenerative conditions, um, mood swings, insomnia, hair loss, weight gain, any of those things, we always like to look at the gut microbiome because it totally regulates so many functions in your body. And the reason I bring up the ALS is because even in traditional conventional fields of medicine, when you look at whether you're looking at neurodegenerative diseases, there are studies actually ongoing right now as we speak. And I was on the task force for it two years ago before that, there was no talk of gut microbiome in the traditional world. Now, we're actually looking at a study at the gut microbiome of ALS patients versus controls, Parkinson's patients versus controls, Alzheimer's patients versus controls. If the gut microbiome can cause such hefty, such chronic, and such advanced diseases, we know how important it is in all the different symptoms that we get. So we have to start in the gut because we've got to balance that healthy bacteria and we've got to repopulate the gut, check for leaky gut syndrome. We have to check for um, gut dysbiosis. And oftentimes, Dr. Tom and I know this, we do this with stool testing. And the reason that is so important is because we need to really delve in and see what is going on in your gut so that we know where to start and what needs to be repaired. Um, there are definitely bacteria that are overgrowing in certain conditions like this and other healthy bacteria that we don't have enough of. And if we have difficulty with, with absorption, if we have malabsorption, and if we have um, dysbiosis, we're not going to get the nutrients. And so when it comes to hair loss specifically, you need the right nutrients, i.e. if you're vitamin B12 deficient, you're not only gonna be tired and low on energy, but most people will see some level of hair loss. There are some other nutrients that are super important in um, hair loss, such as biotin, such as zinc, such as selenium, such as you know iron. All of these are super important. And if you have gut dysbiosis, guess what? You could be eating some amazing diet. You could be eating very healthy foods, all organic, cutting out gluten, et cetera, but you may not absorb it because you have gut malabsorption. So that is a direct connection between what's happening with your hair loss or other symptoms and your gut. Because if you're dysbiotic, you're not going to absorb what you need to be able to balance everything in your body. And balance is key. You know, it's so hard to know what depth to go into, because I'm watching the screen here while you're talking, and we get a heart that kind of floats by every once in a while, and <laughs> then there's another one that comes, because people are, um, is it that this is old information for you, or and you've heard this before from me, because I talk about this every week, it doesn't matter what the topic is, it's always a functional medicine approach, or have you guys fallen asleep out there? Or, you know, you know, I live on the hearts and the thumbs up and stuff because that keeps me going and wanting to right. tell you more and more and more. Yes. So either our audience is um, dozing uh -oh. or, or, or they're just so, uh, or they're thinking deeply uh -huh. about what you're talking about. And here come some hearts and thumbs. Oh, thank you so much. There you That's go. <laughs> <laughs> we like the love. We like the I love, do, do, right? You know, because we're we're not on stage anymore where the right. audience is right there in front of us, you know? And yeah. so when when I can see the look on someone's face and they go, wow, I didn't know that. That just makes right. me want to kind of go there a little bit longer, you know? And right. so it's really hard for us at this end, looking at ourselves on the screen when I'm mm -hmm. talking, you know, I don't want to look at myself, uh, you know, it, it, so anyway, thank, thank you all for staying engaged with us during this process. Uh, there was a question from Sean Quilo. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any recommendations for someone who is DQ2 and DQ8? Now, those are the genes that make one vulnerable to celiac disease. Doesn't mean they're going to get the disease. It means they're vulnerable to it. 
and HLA-DR, the dreaded mold genes. Should we be on a binder contiguously since detox is affected? That's a really good question. And um, uh, so if I'm understanding that, what she's saying is, look, I've got the genes for celiac. I've got the, the gene for mold accumulation in my body. Um, should I be doing some preventive measure by taking some of these um, uh, agents that act like a sponge to absorb toxins in the gut? Should I be doing that on a regular basis? And uh, Dr. Shell, how, how would you start with that question? First of all, kudos to um, that question because it's a very well thought out question. Um, the way that I would answer that is, first of all, you're being proactive, which is, which is amazing, right? So you're thinking ahead. You're thinking about all that is going on inside your body. And we all know, right? We all know we're surrounded by toxins. As much as we try so hard to clean up our environment, our cleaning products, you know, our EMF, we're trying to clean all of that up. We're still being exposed to so many toxins around us. So I'm a big believer in the detoxification is not a week long or a two week long process or even a three month process. We have to think detoxification is a lifestyle. So I look at that in two different ways. Number one, I always tell my patients, you've got to stop the stimuli and the toxins as much as possible. And I consider that a form of detoxification as well when you're detoxing your environment and you're detoxing what you're putting in your body, on your skin, in your hair. So any product that Dr. Tom and I probably will recommend is going to be you know, as toxin free as we can possibly get, right? Especially if we're talking about hair loss, all of that is very important as well to get those kinds of products. Now, when you're looking at, okay, I'm already toxic, which most of us are, what do I do now? Um, personally, I am a big fan in, of binders. I'm a big fan of Zeobind and chlorella, those are great binders that actually will bind the toxins that we have in our bodies and um, that will continue get, to get exposed to. And so I'm a big fan of using binders on a long-term basis. Now, of course, you don't want to do anything continuously, in my opinion, because then you might get a little bit tolerant to it and you want to change things up because your body needs a little change um, at times. And then the other thing about detoxification is just like Dr. Tom said earlier, it's what you're putting inside your mouth, which is the biggest thing that you have to look at. What are you putting inside your mouth and how are you going to make that toxin free? So you want to eat more anti-inflammatory foods such as ginger, turmeric, those kinds of foods that are gonna go in and do a lot of detoxification naturally, right? And Let you wanna avoid the all the- let me ask a question of our audience. How many yeah. of you are, are using ginger or turmeric at least once or twice a week? Give me a thumbs up if you are and um, a smiley if you're not. So, so both of them, <laughs> will look good. They, they look good on the screen. There you go. Um, so ginger, turmeric, they're, they're things that we, we can be adding to our food quite right. You can put turmeric in right. your smoothie. You know, Absolutely. it's so easy and you, and you don't have to taste these things. Yeah. You just have to get them down. Yes. So you don't use enough turmeric to, to take over your blueberry smoothie. But if you put some turmeric in there, your, your body will use those molecules. You know what I've, so, I've started doing recently um, that might help some of the listeners is I actually make my little powder. I have a jar, a glass jar, and I make a powder with organic ground cinnamon ground turmeric and ground ginger. And every morning I take a huge scoop of that, put it in my little cup, add hot water and add my GI revive powder to it. And I feel nice. like, wow, right. I have now detoxified. My gut is happy because I'm giving it the L-glutamine powder. And that to me, I've started that. And, you know, I've been on a cancer journey, as you know, and that's just been great for me. And my energy's gone up. My, uh, I feel detoxified. I feel clean. So some of the listeners might really like to do that because it's easy. 
And I Could like- you say that again? What, what three are, are, are you mixing together? I'm mixing ground cinnamon, ground ginger, and ground turmeric. So I have a big jar with all three, and then I take a huge scoop, mix it with hot water, because it mixes really well with hot water. And I start my day off with that and put a scoop of the GI Revive, which is L-glutamine powder with a few other things, as you know. Um, and to me, I just feel like that's a great start to my day. And then of course the green smoothies and everything come after that, but I like to get these antioxidants in first thing in the morning. And look at her hair. <laughs> look at the result. I, it's been a year from when, when she shaved her head because she was losing her hair dramatically with chemotherapy and yeah. look at the result that this is one of the pearls that we all should be doing is you just get it like an old, um, olive jar you know you buy some olives your family eats the olives yes. and wash it and then you put the powders in there and just shake it up so it mixes well and yeah. that should blend you know you just it does. use a dry spoon just use a dry spoon every day when you do it and it's simple once you set it up super don't, simple and yeah and it just makes you feel great and immune system you know i mean everybody knows it's going to it's going to protect your immune system, which right now is on everybody's mind. I mean, it's such yes. a gr so great for your immune system. Yes, that's really. Sorry, I didn't idea. mean to interrupt you, Doctor Tom. No, 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 no. It's, it's a great idea, and yeah. you don't have to open a jar of cinnamon every day and take a right. little bit out, and open a jar of turmeric and take a little bit out. You know, that's too. You don't have time for that. So Nobody. mix it together. Mix it yes. together. And you just take a scoop and throw it in. That's right. And that's it's super easy. With all of this. Now, because Dr. Shell is talking about one of the things she does to help um, with her gut by using this mixture, I'm going to talk about a product that, you know, I've never talked about products very much. And I've told my staff, okay, I'll talk about a product every week, one product. And so that we, so that you guys can get educated. And in our team meeting that happened a couple of days ago, uh, uh, the team was shocked when they really learned about the GS support packs, mm -hmm. that these packs have five different pills in them. You know, people aren't going to open up five or six bottles every day and take this stuff long-term. They'll do it when they're sick for a little while, but not for very long. So I came up with this idea. I said, Mrs. Patient, can you take one pack a day? One pack a day. Well, yeah. Now there's, you know, there's six pills in there, but can you take one pack a day? And she said, well, yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. The GS support packs, they have 22 different nutrients in them. Every single one of them has great science on how, on helping to heal the gut. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them in there. Why? It's called a pleiotropic approach. There's a really good geek word it's too I long like it. for scrabble. It's, you, 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 you can't use it with a scrabble but it's <laughs> a, a pleiotropic approach and it means all roads lead to rome everything in here leads to a healthy gut and the the genes that get turned on the anti-inflammatory genes that get turned on by glutamine which is in there are different then the genes that get turned on, the anti-inflammatory genes from vitamin D that's mm -hmm. in there, which is different than the genes that get turned on for the anti-inflammatory effect from broccoli seed extract, mm -hmm. which is different. And I can go through 22 different nutrients to set, tell you about all this. So right. when you are ready to heal your gut, you can't just take the GS sensitivity packs and think everything's okay because you have to change the lifestyle that's caused the problem in the gut. That's mm -hmm. primary, mm -hmm. but to help your body heal, to help your body turn on the genes, rev up those genes for an anti-inflammation, build new healthy cells and calm down the genes for inflammation, create leaky gut. The GS support packs, I've never seen anything that is as powerful. And we take one pack a day, every day, have the years. For years That's and awesome. my uh, uh coo uh said i was shocked I'm, I'm taking five different things but they're all in the gs packs if i took right. one pack and it's so much cheaper yeah. you know if i took one pack a day that i'd get all that done i don't want to open all those bottles 
And so we'll put a link in there for you to take a look at this product right. because it ties in with what Dr. Shell was just saying. It has now, to be. And to your point, Dr. Tom, you know, I'm so glad that you have these packs because to your point, whatever is easy will become long term. Whatever is yes. not easy. And if you have to open five different things, it may be something you might do for a month, maybe three months, but you're not going to do it long term because guess what? We are all very busy people, right? So no, that's what I'm, I try to do with my patients, just like you, is whatever we can do to make it easier. It's the same thing that I tell them, you know, for smoothies, for example, get all your wonderful stuff in your smoothies, you know, my, the green proteins, you want to get your, you know, all your greens, all your antioxidants and your berries and your, uh, you know, all of that, just put it all in the pro and the smoothie. And that way it's easy. Right. It's easy. And I have a little box and everything is in there. So I know when I'm making my smoothie, my organic flaxseed is there, my chia is there, my hemp is there, my protein powder is there, my GI Revive is there, your, you know, your packs are amazing, put it all in. And I think that as patients, because I went through it, right, I know from personal experience, treating my husband's ALS, I mean, literally, we're on 30 different supplements, because he, of course, needs it, right? We yeah. have to support his mitochondria. We have to support his gut. We have to support detoxification. There's so much that we have to do. With my cancer journey, a similar story. I had to support so many things to get my circulating tumor cells to a zero from 19 before I started this journey. But it takes a lot of effort. And so yeah. whatever we can do, like your product to make it easier. That's what we have to do because we really want to, we're, we're in it for the long game, not for the short game. You know, so that's great. really wonderful to say. And uh, you're absolutely right on that. And anytime we can make it easier, it's, um, it helps to ensure more success. Yes. But I have to confess to everyone Last night, you know, we're we're in the capital now of Costa Rica. We came in yesterday. We'll be here for five days, a couple of doctor's visits and things. Everything's good. But and so we got in to uh, I, I rent this condo when we come into town about four in the afternoon and Gio's bedtime is at five. So and we hadn't gone shopping yet. There was no food in the house. So there's a Italian restaurant close by that uh uh, we enjoy going to that's got gluten-free pizzas. And people that follow me know that 50, 54% of gluten-free pizzas are not gluten-free. That's true. That's why we've got E3 Advance Plus and we rescue and we have those with us when we travel. So I went over there. Uh, uh, I couldn't find their phone number. So I drove over there and I placed the order and Marzi said that she would text me everything she wanted. And uh, I didn't look at the text and because I've got a good memory. So I ordered everything we wanted on the gluten-free pizza and I waited and I brought it home. And when I came home, Gio was asleep and, or Marzi was still in the bedroom with them, but I was really hungry, hadn't had lunch. And so I ate a piece, uh, not waiting for Marzi. I said, wow, oh, this is really good. This is really good. But now, now I could wait because I had one piece and she came out and sat down and, you know, I poured a little red wine and, and we sit down to eat and she took take one bite and said, and I'm like, but when she grabbed one to take, I grabbed one and I just took three or four bites really quick. I said, well, I'm eating a little fast, but this is really good. And Marcy took one bite and said, there's cheese on this pizza. <laughs> I forgot to order it. No cheese. Oh, I goodness forgot, gracious. That's to say no cheese. But I noticed my body responds, because I haven't had cheese in years, in a few years, I think. I noticed my body response, wow, this is really the best pizza I've ever had. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just eating it, <laughs> quick, quick, where's the E3? And oh, yes. that, that is, um, I bring up the story because once you go gluten-free, once you find that that's something that will work for you to help you on your path to health, you need to have a, a bottle of Wheat Rescue or E3 around yes. all the time to salvage and save you from the mess that you're going to get into. 
I 100% agree. And I've yeah. tried that product myself and it is remarkable. I would highly recommend it. It is because you really, like we said, we can't control it every time. We can't control it 100% of the time. So you really need to save your body from the reactions that you're going to have. I see so here's some- a, Here's a shout out to Heather from Colorado, Allison's New Jersey, Blanche's in LA, uh, Vicky's Carolyn East, um, Kathy Morris is in Queensland, Australia. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for being here. She said, doctors don't know what this is. Who can I go to for help? And uh, that's a really good question. And you have two options right now. One is you can go to the doctor.com. My team is all trained on online consultations. That's what they do. And I believe, Dr. Show, you also do online consultations, don't you? Yes. Yes, we do virtual and consultations. And where, where can they find you? What's the website? It's drshell.com, D-R-S-H-E-L.com. Okay. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And you know, interestingly enough, I think it's such a tough thing, right? Whether it's that you're dealing with thyroid issues or hair loss issues, really it's important to look at the entire picture. And this can be a six hour course, right? So, you know, we've created a course because we want to make sure that we talk about why nutrition is important, what nutritional supplementation is important, why inflammation is such a cause, what to do about the adrenals, what to do about thyroid, what to do about hormones. And I will say that if the hair loss is something that is sort of advanced or you want to get it back quicker, you really need to look at those root causes, eliminate inflammation, change your diet, get appropriate sleep, manage your stress, get your thyroid in order. And of course, we can have that discussion for several hours and how to do that. But also there are wonderful supplements that are super powerful that, you know, have actually have the keratin and have an gain, which is, you know, a very, very important product that regrows hair and really stimulates that hair follicle. And all of this is based on intense research. Um, in addition to that, there are practices wherever you are across the country, you might want to look into hair PRP, which is really cutting edge and an amazing procedure that a lot of people don't know about. Um, and uh, you know what that is, is you're using your, in, your own collagen derived growth factors. So the physicians that do this, what we do is we draw your blood, spin it down, we separate the platelet poor plasma with the platelet rich plasma. We take that platelet rich plasma, which is your own collagen derived growth factors and inject it into the scalp. And that in itself will stimulate the hair follicles naturally. And the results are, oh my gosh, they're, oh my gosh, <laughs> wonderful that's, results. That's a classic example of epigenetics, local yes. epigenetics. You're changing the environment around mm -hmm. the genes in the scalp. Correct. And, and Correct. the goal of course, long-term is that that those plasma rich cells are circulating more throughout your entire body yes. when you start getting your little bottle of cinnamon and turmeric and, and using it every morning and yes. you're doing all those little things which takes yes. you six months to a year to learn how right. to do when yes. you start doing that then you're in because that goes right along with a question that i saw here that was a really good question uh um uh, Gwendolyn says, my hair always thins out after surgery. It takes a good year to start getting thicker again. Well, Gwendolyn, that means that the regenerative aspect of your health, the cellular regeneration is sluggish. It's great that it's working. Yeah. It's really great. And it takes a year. But um, I can almost assure you two years from now, if you start making your little jar of the three spices that Dr. <laughs> Shell's talking about, you know, when you do the other little things, which I'm sure you're, you're doing a number of them already, but yeah. a couple of years from now, as you've, as you've supplied more of those supportive nutrients, mm -hmm. you're going to say, you know, uh, hopefully I'm not having surgeries anymore, but I, hopefully this is my last one, but my yeah. hair came back really thick within three months instead of a year. Exactly. Exactly. Kind of 
It's how are you going to expedite the process? How are you going to give your body what it needs? And that's where the supplements come in. I mean, I when I lost my hair for the first time 17 years ago, ever since then I've developed hair loss supplements. The most recent one is called Deeply Rooted Hair Growth because to me, you don't just need to slow down the hair loss. You need to actually push out the hair growth. And that can be done with these supplements as well as procedures like hair PRP and a low level laser, which is very safe and it actually stimulates the hair follicles to regenerate faster. So when you combine supplements, hair PRP, low level laser, and then clean out the micro environment, well, hey, you're going to get results much faster than you would have otherwise. Yes, yes. Yeah. Magda has a question. Yes. I have Hashimoto's diagnosed 24 years ago. I'm followed by a general GP who has me on Synthroid, the same dose all along, testing me every year. That's a warning right there. That's yeah. an absolute warning because they're just waiting for it to get worse. All right, right, you're okay, you're okay. Since about three years, I watch my diet and supplement with selenium, vitamin B complex, vitamin D, and zinc and omega-3s. Good for you. I still get pains all over at times, as well as bowel problems and hair loss. How will I know when I am rebalanced? You're, that's a really good question. And I'm going to start with this one because Magda, there's nothing that you've said that has uh, referred to you're exploring why all this is happening to me, that you're, you're doing the part about taking some supplements, which is really good but there must be something in your environment and the world you live in, uh, in the food that you're eating, that's contributing to the inflammation that's being kept in check right now. So your thyroid seems to be functioning, but I guarantee you it's probably not. Mm -hmm. And your GP is just waiting for the test when it's worse. And then they're gonna modify your medication, maybe change your medication. You have to explore where is this coming from? a most common contributor with thyroid issues and Hashimoto's is a sensitivity to wheat, most common. And we know that people with a sensitivity to wheat who have thyroid problems, in one study, they were monitoring TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone made in the pituitary, determining what dose of medication to give the patient based on getting their TSH below two. And until it came down to below two, they kept upping the dose of the medication. And then finally, when it got down to below two, that's the dose you stay on. And they found that the people that had a sensitivity to wheat needed 49% more medication than the people that did not have a sensitivity to wheat. And when they put them on a gluten-free diet, they had to reduce their medication dramatically by 50% within, I think it was two months, maybe three, mm -hmm. because their medication was too high. They were hyperactive because no longer was gluten affecting thyroid function. And I tell you that because there are many triggers you have to look at. You go see Dr. Shell. If you work with Dr. Shell online or with my team online, there's a list of questions that you have to go through and so that we can ascertain where likely the triggers are that are causing this problem. Right. Now, right. taking the B vitamins and fish oils and zinc um, are really great for our you. Is our good number one app. That, that's a good thing. I, I didn't quite hear what that was, but somebody got a comment in there, uh, I think for my team. But taking the supplements you're taking is a really good thing to do, and it isn't gonna fix the problem. It'll help you feel a little better perhaps, but it won't fix the problem until you can identify where is the gasoline coming from mm -hmm. that's causing the inflammation that's manifesting as thyroid dysfunction. Couldn't Dr. agree Shelton, more. Anything you want to add to that? Couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, you really hit it on the nail where, you know, it's great that you're taking some form of thyroid, but Dr. Tom and I would both agree that T3 hormone 
is very important, not just the T4. So Synthroid is just T4. And as we discussed earlier, you don't have receptor sites for T4. You need to be able to convert the T4 to T3, which takes a healthy microenvironment, the right nutrition, the right enzymes, which most of us are deficient in. And when you have inflammation, you're not going to be able to convert, which is why you're not feeling well. You're not feeling well because A, your levels need to be probably checked much more in depth and all the things that Dr. Tom and I discussed, all those lab results. And in addition to that, the inflammation needs to go away. You need to also have your doctor check your adrenal glands and your sex hormones because they all work together as a symphony. And if they're not all balanced, your thyroid is just not going to feel, um, you're not gonna feel balanced. You're still gonna have symptoms like you're having of hair loss and fatigue and other symptoms that you're dealing with. So um, one thing I always tell my patients is just keep going up on the thyroid is not the solution. It's to see what caused you to get here in the first place. And let's focus on those root causes and let's then make you holistically well and comprehensively well. Debbie's here from the Gold Coast in Australia. Hey, Debbie, love the Gold Coast. I've, I've spoken there a few times and it's I, I just love it there. Uh, Sharon says, again, too fast. Teaching is different than speaking to biochemists. Sharon, you're absolutely right. We apologize for that. But that's what's so great about Facebook is that you can go back and watch it again and again and again. The links will be on my website, thedr.com. So Facebook and thedr.com. And you can watch this and take notes and, and you'll hear things that you didn't hear the first time around. And right. for us, there are so many things to try to tell you. And you know, it, it is a teaching problem uh, for me that I speak too fast and give too much information. Uh, doctors tell me this, you know, that it's just, my God, doc, this is such great information, but it's so overwhelming. I can't take it all in. I understand that's why you've got the notes go back and review. So here's, here's how you take in this kind of stuff. If, and usually it's at a conference, but for Facebook, it, Facebook Live, it's the same thing. If you review within 24 hours, like the notes you took, or maybe watch it again, review within 24 hours, and then review once more within 72 hours, three days, you convert it from short-term memory to long-term memory you convert a large percentage of what you've heard now three times to long-term memory. And you've got, you've got it down. So uh, our apologies for talking too fast and giving so much information. We're going from the thyroid to the adrenals, to the sex hormones, to the gut. And I know, I know it's overwhelming. And I'm going to um, uh, uh, end with this example that 1986, a ga young gastroenterologist in Australia said, you know, I think sometimes, he actually wrote a paper and said, I think sometimes ulcers are caused by a bacteria. And all of the gastroenterologists said, what are you, a nutcase? Everybody knows that ulcers are caused by too much acid and you have to give antacids. That's why antacids have been in the top 10 medications, billions of dollars every year forever is because everyone knows this mm -hmm. and he didn't care. So what did he do? He did an endoscopy, he put a tube down his throat into his stomach with a camera, a little camera in the end of it, took pictures of the healthy pink tissue of his stomach. Then he drank a beaker of, of bacteria, a beaker of Heliobacter pylori, this very common bacteria that we get. And then he waited five days until he was as sick as could be. And then did another endoscopy and took pictures of the health of the ulcers in his stomach. Then he took the antibiotics and waited about 10 days until he was feeling better and did another endoscopy and took pictures of the healing ulcers in his stomach. Then he published this with the pictures. Then everyone knew he was a nutcase. But he proved that sometimes ulcers are caused by a bacteria.
But people mm -hmm. were still so, so threatened by this. Gastroenterologists were so threatened by thinking outside the box of what they had read in their textbooks that he was still ostracized. He didn't care. 21 years later, Dr. Barry Marshall wins the Nobel Prize in medicine for this paper. And they said to Dr. Barry Marshall and his partner, and this is the exact quote, who with tenacity and a prepared mind challenged prevailing dogma. Mm -hmm. So you want to change the direction your health is going, you need tenacity, which means one hour a week, every week, I'm allocating to learn something new. I'm going to watch this Facebook Live, you know, one more time. So maybe it's every Tuesday night after dinner, every Sunday morning after services, whenever it is, but you tell your family, this is my time every week to learn a little bit more of how we all can be healthier. But mm -hmm. every week you do this, that's tenacity because you're preparing your mind by learning new things to challenge the way you thought it was supposed to go. You don't get a disease unless something's wrong in the way that your body is living right now. And you, you, you don't live right now with the intent of being sick. So there's something that you just didn't know. You have to change your paradigm. You have to think differently. So with tenacity, one hour a week, every week, preparing your mind to challenge prevailing dogma, that's how you win your own Nobel Prize in health for you and your family. Dr. Shell, I wanna thank you for being here today, tonight, uh, depending on where they are in the world. <laughs> you know, the time goes so fast. I mean, it world, does. World. It goes it's so been fast. a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. You have a wonderful audience and it's been a pleasure to speak to them. And again, you know, um, I say the same thing. We apologize. We just get so passionate about everything that we wanna share with you and we want to teach and we wanna educate. So I hope that, you know, you were able to take something really important um, from this that'll help you in the long run. I so, agree. I agree. Yeah, Couldn't say it yeah. better. And thank you all for the little hearts and the thumbs up. It's really nice to see that. And we will see you next week. Take, take care. care everybody. Bye-bye.